So when looking at credit card fees, there are quite a number of different fees that Canadians need to be aware of. Some of them, they might not even be aware that they're being charged. And one that really comes to mind is whether it's an authorized user fee. So you are the primary card holder and you've signed up your spouse or one of your kids for a subsidiary card. You will be most likely charged $20 to $40 a year for that card. Hello, welcome to Strictly Money, where we make finance easy to help you navigate your wealth journey. I'm Sejal Patel. All right, on today's show, we are digging into a topic that may make you rethink how you bank. You see, there's a recent report that looked at Canadian banking fees, and it compared it to the UK and Australia. And the results are eye-popping. It turns out that Canadians are paying way more for basic banking fees compared to our international counterparts. That's right. So joining me today to uncover all of this and with her advice on how to lower those fees is Natasha McMillan. Natasha is the Director of Everyday Banking at RateHub.ca and she joins me now. Hi, Natasha. Great to have you on Strictly Money. You can see uh, we have a new podcast format. Great. So excited to be here. So, um, Natasha, this report says that Canadians are paying billions in what they say is excess um, banking fees. Can you just kind of run through what this report found high level? Yeah. So this report from a consulting company, North Economics, found that, as you mentioned, Canadians are overpaying by billions of dollars a year in these bank account fees. That actually breaks out to about $250 per Canadian. And so some of these fees are anywhere from uh, monthly fees, overdraft fees, and they've actually looked at comparing the top five banks in Canada to those in the UK and Australia. Okay, so let's dive into it because I had a look at um, the report. Um, the author there, I guess he lived in the UK and he came over to Canada, it looks like, Alan de Bassart. So he was comparing, as you said, um, Canadian banks to the, the ones in the UK and Australia. Um, I found what was really interesting, he said that in the UK, you can hold multiple banks at multiple locations, and there are no fees for what he would call reasonable activities. So that's not the case in Canada. Absolutely not. Unfortunately, most bank accounts for most Canadians, unless you're a senior or a youth or a student, you do pay monthly fees. The only way to get out of that for most of us in Canada is to hold that minimum balance which can be quite difficult for us. Yeah, that minimum balance can be somewhere, well, it depends, I guess, on the bank, but I know it can be sometimes $3,000, $5,000. Exactly. And a lot of us, especially kind of given um, the economy right now, are struggling to make ends meet. And so that holding that balance of 3000 can be quite difficult. Yeah. Natasha, is there a difference between savings and checking accounts, though? Because... Um, my understanding is usually with checking accounts, you have less fees, but I, I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, there can be less fees. However, there are as well those hidden fees. Sometimes in a ch savings account, if you transfer money out, you are going to be charged uh, for a transaction, whereas with a checking account, you might not be. So it's always important to kind of read those finer details and be aware of what's um, allowed or what you will be charged within each account. So let's run through some of the, the different fees, Natasha. So one is what, writing checks? I mean, I would consider that reasonable. Absolutely. However, um, having personally experienced this, ordering checks book, checkbooks charge you about $20, if not more, from a bank account. So that is an already a fee that's kind of built in. I know up until recently, our daycare, for example, for our kids, only accepted written predated checks. And so you're already kind of paying for that for what used to be deemed a regular transaction. What about e-transfers then or using debit? So e-transfers is one that has been seen to become more and more common um, for a $0 fee. The 
debit transactions, now what we've been seeing in, in this report highlights that an ATM withdrawal with a bank that isn't your own can charge you anywhere from $1 to $9. When you compare that wow. to the UK or Australia, it's actually zero. And that can add up for a lot of individuals if you have to randomly get cash um, and you can't find a bank nearby, it does kind of put you in a difficult position. Yeah. I mean, I can see in, in some ways the bank will say, listen, you got to use our ATMs. Um, you know, they can be very territorial. And so if you use their use your bank's ATM, it might be free. Um, Natasha, you know what? This is it, it's interesting timing that we're we're talking about this because yesterday, I mean, I'm I'm part of my Facebook community group, and uh, someone had actually posted that. Uh, they were at their bank and uh, they noticed that the fees are going up as of May, I, I think. And, and they were up in arms about it. And then, you know, you started seeing a lot of comments. So I went to my bank and lo and behold, um, I also see that fees are going up as of May 1st. And I just want to run through some of these. And, and it looks like these are savings plans, most of them. But I mean, these fees right now monthly run anywhere from, say, $13 to $30. Uh, it looks like all of them are going up by about a dollar. I thought what was really interesting is it looks like they're starting to charge debit card purchases in store in line. So, so transaction fees for that. Um, bill payments using the ATM. Now, this is a little bit surprising. Um, interact e-transfers, it looks like for some of these accounts are going to be charging. It looks like these are savings accounts. Um, but what are your thoughts? It's interesting. And it, and it is unfortunate for Canadians because some people might not necessarily be reading all the email that's coming to their accounts and being notified well in advance. And I, I will say I am notorious for this. I know my bank kind of sends emails to my accounts and sometimes you don't look at it because you think it's your monthly statement. But what is actually happening behind the scenes is you're paying more for the service that you've gotten used to using. Um, and it does start to become an issue. And I know kind of when I grew up, I didn't have a credit card. My parents were very against credit cards at a young age. And so I used my debit card. And when I was in university as a student, you can tap that debit card. There's no transaction fees. You have unlimited, uh, or back in the day, you did have unlimited use. Whereas now there is a maximum. And every time you use it above, whether it's 10 or 15, you do get charged. And so as a student or coming newly out of school, that does add up over time and can kind of significantly impact your savings. Yeah. And these are the people who don't necessarily have, like you said, that minimum balance, right? Um, so they're going to be hit even harder. Um, can you, Natasha, can you talk a little bit about non-sufficient funds and overdraft fees, what they are and what people need to be aware of? So unfortunately, both of those do have high charges here in Canada. Non-sufficient funds is when you try and run a transaction and you don't have the fees to actually pay for it. And so unfortunately here in Canada, we get charged anywhere from $45 to $50. Wow, okay. Making that even more specific, if I wrote a check to my daycare, for example, my daycare provider tried to cash that and I didn't have the funds, I would be charged not only probably a fee from my daycare, but also from my bank saying non-sufficient funds, we tried to run this through. So it does um, impact Canadians. And again, it is kind of one of those unfortunate things. And in the report we saw in the UK and Australia, it's actually a zero dollars to a few dollars as opposed to the 50 we're seeing here in Canada. Yeah. I mean, I can play the devil's advocate and say, you know, you should make sure you have enough money um, because because it, it's a cost to the banks. Um, I would question, though, whether 45 or $50 is, is, a, is a heavy, heavy penalty. Um, Natasha, why do you think we pay so much? It's an interesting take. And I think there are kind of a lot of different opinions out there. But Certainly what we see here in Canada is we are dominated by a few large banks, which does lead to less competition and unfortunately fewer options for consumers. Um, there was kind of even with RBC kind of striking a deal with HSBC, there was a lot of Canadians who came out and said this is only making the environment more difficult. Um, so was an issue for us here as well. Um, and 
the Canadian regulatory environment does currently allow banks to charge these higher fees. Competition, I think, is is really a, an important piece, right? Because people do need choices. Uh, again, it was really interesting on this this Facebook group and, and the comments that were coming out. A lot of people were suggesting the non brick and mortar uh, banks, right? So not the five big five, but banks like Tangerine. Simply, what are your thoughts? I think as Canadians, we're very much used to these five big banks that have a well-established name. Our grandparents and our parents use them. We probably had our first accounts at them as well. Um, And I do think it is great. And one of the things we need to do, whether it's for a mortgage or for a very simple checking account, is to really shop around and be aware of the options out there. So it might not be the bank that's down the street with the brick and mortars, but it might be Simply or Tangerine that do offer zero dollar checking accounts um, for every Canadian and kind of is a great way to save money. I I do have to mention, Natasha, that um, uh, Deputy Minister Christia Freeland, also our finance minister, she has been calling for lower banking fees and uh, actually said, you know, she's directing the Financial Consumer Agency of Canada. This is the FCAC to to work on making these no or low cost banking options. Um, do you have any insight into this? I, do you think that what she says will actually happen? It is one of those tough things. Being here in Ottawa, we do hear a lot about kind of the movement the government wants to advocate for these banking fees, particularly to try and address the rising cost of living and financial burden that some of the Canadians are feeling. It will unfortunately take time. Regulation does need to come into place. It needs to get approved. Um, So hopefully as we start to kind of see these initiatives play out, um, it will happen, but it does certainly take time and will have to be implemented most likely as regulation for the banks to kind of implement and adhere to. Mm. You know, and I do have to say, I, I know a lot of people do not pay a lot of these banking fees, right? I think if they have that minimum balance. Um, but I, I always, I also say this is really about making sure that you're paying for what you get and it's about value. And, and, you know, for me personally, I question that, like, are we paying for what we're actually getting and is it reasonable? Um, Natasha, we're going to, we're going to take a quick break and hear from our sponsors, BMO ETFs, whom without, I could not be doing this show. And, uh, and when we come back, we'll dive into what Canadians can do to lower those costs. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Strictly Money. I'm here with Natasha McMillan of RateHub.ca. Um, Natasha, we've been talking about these excessive banking fees that uh, a lot of Canadians pay. If uh, a Canadian does find themselves in that situation, what can they do? So one of the best things to do is to start shopping around and have these conversations with your banks. Perhaps you are using a premium account Um, And that is kind of what you have been used to. But as you've got your finances in order, you actually don't need that many debit transactions or monthly fee payments that you're unaware that you're paying for. So it's really kind of doing a check stock of what you actually need from your bank account and shopping around to kind of find that lowest option that is available. And again, as we mentioned, considering those online banks or credit unions that might have those lower fees. So if you are, say, at one of the big five banks and and assuming, you know, they're charging uh, um, something that you don't want to have to pay and you find that there is a different option, is it easy to switch? It is easy to switch within banks. Um, And that is kind of the premium. They do like to kind of help you stay within a bank. Where it does start to get difficult is when you do want to move across banks or transfer all your accounts to another bank. Oh, okay. Tell us about that. Well, (laughs) I'm going to consider, I'm going to assume there's a lot of sludge. They're going to, they're making, they're going to make it very difficult. 
Yeah, like for an example of this that I can think of is when my husband and I got married, we talked about joining accounts and making it easy to kind of have all of our payments in one and our um, kind of salaries go into one account. And what we found is despite meetings at my bank and his bank and other banks, the number of paperwork and different conversations that we had to have while having two jobs and trying to start a family was too much of a burden. And so actually made it very difficult. And I'll be honest, and I hate to admit this, but many years later, we still haven't quite resolved it. <laughs> yeah. And, and I mean, there is, there has been books written on this, right? Intentional sludge. This is what it is. They make it very difficult. And then people just kind of give in. Um, Natasha, can people negotiate? And, and I asked this because I remember I was in that situation and I was going to switch banks. And I said, unless you offer me what this other bank is offering me, I'm moving. And they relented and they gave me that. There are many stories out there where negotiating is part of it. I think it does ultimately depend how many accounts you hold within the bank. If you're a mortgage customer and a credit card customer and a bank account customer, Certainly, I think they will look to kind of make accommodations, but it really depends on your banking behaviors, um, your credit worthiness, and the relationship that you have with that particular bank. So that's, you just raised a, an important point. You know how um, telecom companies, they, they offer bundling prices. Do banks do that? They don't advertise it quite outright. Ah, okay. But as part of this holistic view of their customer it is understood that they do kind of look at all facets of what a customer can provide to the bank. Yeah. So maybe that's when you can negotiate saying, look, I have this and this and this with you. Give me a, give me a better rate. Okay. Okay. Well, speaking of holistic view, um, I want to get your insights on open banking. Cause I know, I know you have some thoughts around this. Yeah. So open banking is one of those things I think we're all a little bit afraid of because we don't necessarily know what it means. Yeah. So maybe explain what it means first for, for our viewers and listeners. One of the biggest things that it does allow, which is part in the fear, is allowing the sharing of our banking data. So in the example that I gave earlier, is it will make it that much easier to move accounts. Whereas right now we do have that slugness and difficulty in the paperwork and understanding how to move this around. But what this will allow us to do is to actually, between banks and financial institutions, have that transfer of information in a much more seamless way. And so, of course, data can be scary, but it does have tremendous benefits for Canada. Uh, Canadians and can actually end up dro dropping those costs for us. You know, I have I have to say I, I did an interview on on open banking and we were flooded <laughs> with comments. Um, a lot of people misunderstood it, but I can tell you, Natasha, the biggest fear was. I mean, a lot of people just don't trust the government. They're like, what are you going to do with my information? Um, are you going to freeze my account? Are you going to spy on me? This is probably the biggest concern. And, and it is kind of one of those valid concerns of Canadians. However, we have seen other jurisdictions offer open banking, and there is tremendous benefits to Canadians. And I don't think there is a sense of worry that the government is spying on us through this way. I think if that was the way they probably already are, unfortunately, if that's kind of the root of thinking of the connections they have with the top five banks does kind of give them that as well. So I don't see that being as a change through open banking. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a pros, it, it's a pros and cons kind of thing. Um, you know, I, if I'm correct, Singapore does this and, and I lived in Singapore, but I could see some of the benefits because when someone has a holistic view, um, they can offer you proper products. You you can you can manage your finances a lot better. But again, the trust has to be there. I mean, there has to be regulations that make sure that something you know maybe corrupt or that's not intended to to happen doesn't happen. Exactly, and I think that will come into play as uh, Christian Phelan. There's supposed to be an announcement coming out later this month with regards to open banking. And I think as we start to educate Canadians on what it is 
And as you mentioned, the regulation that will be overseeing this will be very important to ensure that Canadians are bought into it over time. Well, I I know they were going to release something last year, and so they've delayed this. So obviously, some thought has been been going into it. They're probably getting a lot of feedback. And we should mention, Natasha, that it is optional. People don't have to do this. No. Yeah. And, it, and it can be kind of as an opt-in, as you mentioned, through your bank um, and things like that. So there will be many options for Canadians and it can be over time. We will most likely see that rate of opt-in increase as well. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to that announcement in, in a month. Um, Natasha, can we touch on credit card fees? Um, you know, c- because we've talked about banking fees and, you know, and, and I understand that, you know, people feel that it's unreasonable. But credit card fees are unreasonable. I mean, when I think about the interest fees that are charged, um, what are your thoughts and, and what do consumers need to be aware of? So when looking at credit card fees, there are quite a number of different fees that Canadians need to be aware of. Some of them, they might not even be aware that they're being charged. And one that really comes to mind is whether it's an authorized user fee, so you are the primary card holder and you've signed up your spouse or one of your kids for a subsidiary card, you will be most likely charged twenty to forty dollars a year for that card. Um, so that's kind of one fee. The other fee that I think a lot of us with kind of online shopping and kind of travel that we haven't um, been very aware of until more recently is that foreign transaction fee. So for any charge made outside of Canadian dollars, um, you are typically charged 2.5% of the purchase price. And that is on top of the exchange fees. So there is kind of that additional amount that is built in and we don't see it as a line item on our credit card statement. So we are less aware of it. Yeah. Uh, I just came back from the US. <laughs> I did I did a little shopping in New York and, and Philly. So I'm a little scared to, to look at my credit card bill. But you know, and I know this, except that it's it's convenient. Exactly. Can you get around it? Can you can you do something to avoid those foreign exchange fees? I, I think they have cards now, if I'm Exa- correct. There I'm are correct. certainly yeah. a few cards that offer no foreign transaction fees. And a lot of kind of the people who are focused on building rewards and travel points and things like that do believe that the cards that offer um, kind of great value for your points, it is still worth kind of paying that transaction fee. So it's really about doing that balance of how much are you earning for your points and your spend versus how much are you actually paying um, as a transaction fee as well on top of that. Are there types of credit cards that you would suggest um, that would, like suppose someone just wants something basic to put on in, in Canada? Yeah, so there are, again, um, we mentioned them earlier. Tangerine has, for example, two great credit cards. Uh, one is the Tangerine Money Back and one is the Tangerine World MasterCard. Both of them, no annual fee, um, great rewards for shopping in Canada. Um, and with the Tangerine Money Back, you could pick your reward category. So if you shop a lot for groceries and you want to use it for kind of bill payment, you can select your rewards for those categories. Um, so they, there are a plethora of options for credit cards um, and finding one that works for you and your spending habits. But it does, again, require that shopping around and doing that comparison Um, And again, there are many opportunities to do that. Ratehub.ca is one website that can kind of help Canadians. I was just going to mention that. I I know you've done (laughs) a lot of articles and you have a lot there for people, which is wonderful. Yeah. Well, make sure that we we put your website link in the in the show notes so people can access it. Um, Natasha, thank you so much for for coming on in your in your insights and your tips. I, I know our viewers and listeners will really appreciate it. Thank you. Now, before I let you go, uh, Natasha, I like to ask all my guests three rapid fire questions. Um, And it's just a way for me to just make finance a little bit more human. You know, I like to say humanize (laughs) finance. Um, So here are the three questions. You ready? Ready. Okay. My first question is, what is the best financial advice you've ever received? For me, I would say is making a plan. Whether it's 
you want to save a little bit of money or you're looking to buy a house is starting from the basics, create that budget and make a plan. It doesn't need to be a drastic change to your lifestyle, but starting to have kind of that view of what you want to achieve and taking those baby steps to get there. That's that's a great one um, because I find a lot of people don't plan. They kind, they kind of wing it, right? And I always say, well, you wouldn't go on vacation without planning, you know, how you're going to get there and, and where you're going to stay and your life goals needs a plan. Absolutely. What is the worst financial advice that you've received? Um, I alluded to it earlier, but my not using a credit card until kind of having your first job. Um, I think a lot of people are worried that it can lead to consumer debt. However, if taught how to use it effectively, it can really help kind of build that credit history and your credit score and kind of open the doors for learning how to save, learning how to have kind of a healthy relationship with money. Yeah, um, no, that's that's a really good one. And those good habits being paying it off in full. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Reading your statement, being aware of where your money goes. And that could always kind of help with the budgeting and the planning in the future where you might not be aware that you're, for example, the one that everyone picks up on is spending $40 at Starbucks a month. Yeah. I mean, because we do live in a society where credit cards are, or having one is pretty much a necessity. You know, um, there are countries that is still very cash heavy, um, but we are just not that. Yeah. Okay, my last one um, might need a little bit of thinking, but if you were to enact a law that people had to follow that would improve their financial health, what would it be? So this would actually be one for government, I think, in my mind. Um, And it would be that we should teach financial literacy in school. I think there is a big gap in what we educate children or university or high school students with when it comes to finances. Um, So, and it could be as simple as how to create a budget, how to save the different types of savings accounts. And I could even see in university is perhaps how to file your taxes. There are some very easy tools and mechanisms that Canadians and the younger generation could learn that can put them in the right foot. Um, But a lot of families don't like talking about finances because it is a bit of a taboo subject. And so I think for me, it would be helping educate every Canadian with basic financial literacy. So important. Uh, And I can tell you that I am speaking with the Ontario government about this right now um, because it it is in a lot of curriculums, but it's very, very basic. I mean, thankfully it's there. Um, But I can tell you in the US, they are really leading on this. Um, I think there are something like 30 states, more than half are mandatory one semester instructions, and we are not there yet. Uh, Saskatchewan is probably the first province that is doing this. Um, So I'm very optimistic. I I think we're going to see a lot of changes. and, And I know Certainly, a lot of parents are looking forward to this because they don't know. They want to teach their children, but they don't know enough to do it. Absolutely. Or they don't know how to approach it because they didn't grow up in a family that talked about finances. And so it does kind of break down those barriers. Did your family talk about finances? Unfortunately, no. Uh, We talked about it at a very high level. Savings is important and things like that, but um, not to the extent that we, I probably would educate my children with today. And that's common. That's common, right? I I was, I think I was one of the rare ones where my parents talked about money quite a bit. And, and as a family, we learned together because they were immigrants. So English, um, especially for my mom was not her first language. So she often would hand us, you know, her investment statements and go, can you, can you help figure this out? And, and, you know, I tell the story that shocks a lot of people. My brother, um, who's five years older than me, uh, he at the age of, uh, he would have been maybe 13, he actually would do my parents' taxes. Interesting, <laughs> which is it? great, a yeah. great experience for him. And he's probably learned a lot and has taken that to his family as well. Yeah, yeah, he did. Um, I, I, I mean, I do my own taxes. And one of the best ways I say is actually get the paper. 
you know, if you can find, I don't even know if they have them anymore, but when you go through it, you start understanding the different pieces of, you know, why they're taxing you the way they are. But yeah, fingers crossed, we're going to see, we're going to see this in schools. Um, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Okay. Take care, Natasha. Well, that wraps up this edition of Strictly Money. Don't forget to subscribe. Thank you for watching and we'll see you back here very soon. Until then, stay well, stay wise and stay wealthy.